And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. 1963. Alabama Governor George Wallace makes his infamous stand against integration. To hereby denounce and forbid this illegal and unwarranted action. Here in North Carolina, the 1963 Goldsboro High School yearbook offers a reflection of the times. There is not a single black face. It was a school segregated by law. Fast forward 40 years to the Goldsboro High School yearbook of today, and you'll see students who are still segregated, this time despite the law. And now the faces on the pages are black instead of white. It makes you ask why. It's a situation that disheartens some. It's just sad to me. I don't, I don't know what we're afraid of that keeps us apart. And outrages others. If you plan to go to heaven, there won't be no segregation. City officials want the school system to act. I wish we had a school board that would do that, but no, to date we hadn't had that. And the school board deflects the blame. Everybody's got a piece of this pie and they've got to do it and quit pointing the finger at people. If Wayne County can take comfort in anything, it's knowing that when it comes to racial segregation in North Carolina schools, its school system is not alone. I'm Pam Salsby. Fifty years ago, in the landmark Brown v. Board of Education case, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the legal segregation of schools by race was unconstitutional. In the decades that followed, schools did become much more integrated. But in recent years, there appears to be a gradual return to the racial segregation that the Brown case was supposed to erase. It is happening in many school systems across North Carolina. Wayne County is just one example but some stark numbers there help tell the story. There are 651 black students at Goldsboro High School and only seven white students. Susie Potter is one of them. Yeah, this is a good school and the people are good, but in any environment where you're segregated, you're just not getting a realistic view of what life is like, you know? They, we need everybody here, all kinds of people. When integration of Goldsboro schools began in the mid-60s, so did white flight to suburbs and schools in the county. Many of those who stayed behind took advantage of an open transfer policy to put their children in schools outside the inner city, and others sent their children to private school. By the late 90s, Goldsboro's six inner city schools were almost completely black. I don't understand why, why people are scared to come here, because these are wonderful people. Sorry. The situation also saddens Goldsboro High senior Amber Jacobs. We're not dumb. We're not a bunch of thugs and violent. And just, we're not trying to kill your kids, cook them up, and eat them. We're just the same. The act as if we are some monsters or something. Amber's parents. I mean, you know, it's it's a sad. It's a sad tale. We're just human beings. It's like to me, they're sending a message that. We don't want to be with you, and we're going to do whatever it takes to ensure that we don't. Eighth grader Hannah Emerson is one of only nine white students among nearly 400 black ones at Goldsboro Middle School. I bet it is. I really bet it is. As a student in Goldsboro's inner city attendance area, she's supposed to go on to Goldsboro High School. But next year, her parents are sending her to a school outside the inner city area, to Eastern Wayne High, which is about 50% white. They sent her older sister, Caitlin, there too. So that she could have friends of her same race, uh, along with friends of other races. Our daughters were finding a situation where they were almost feeling like they sometimes they had to justify why they were attending Goldsboro Middle School amongst their white friends. They were being questioned about the schools that they were attending. Do you get picked on? Um, do you get jumped? Do you get beat up? It is because it's basically an African American school and I guess they get images in their heads that there are bad things going on. I wasn't raised that way. I, I don't think that way that, <laughs> that you should look at somebody and 
see that they're black or they're white or whatever in them. <laughs> For the Emersons, eight years in the inner city schools were enough. Do we cave in? Probably. But it was uh, those choices you have to make as a parent and do you do you choose to use your child as the example? You know, do you choose to make your child the Ruby Bridges of 2004 or the Brown Sisters of Brown versus Board of Education? Do you choose to do that in 2004 and use your children? Who can tell me what the problem was in this story? Kim Copeland also faced a tough choice. Like the Emersons, she's allowed her daughter to transfer out of Goldsboro's inner city attendance area from Goldsboro High to Eastern Wayne. My daughter was faced with the challenge of children cutting up in class, not to the point that she was endangered, but to the point that she felt like her academic needs were not being met to the extent they had previously been met. Her daughter was also frustrated by the increasing teacher turnover at Goldsboro High. I just know that we gave it our best shot for all those years and my daughter was ready for a change. So was Copeland. She was a teacher in an inner city school but transferred out to Tommy's Road Elementary School, a school that's almost evenly split black and white and includes a significant number of Asian and Hispanic students. First of all, is this a fictional story or non-fictional story? Every school in this county should be like that. I feel very strongly about that. I don't understand why they aren't like that. With many schools across the county showing that same racial diversity and Goldsboro's population almost evenly split between blacks and whites, many people are asking that same question, why the inner city schools there are nearly 100% black. If you can't get it right in a city that's statistically 50-50 black white, how can you get it right anywhere else? Why, 50 years after the Brown versus Board of Education case, are there still racially segregated schools? The recent anniversary of the Brown ruling has brought new attention to the trend and new analysis of its causes and effects. Type resegregation into a Word document and it comes up as misspelled. It's, it's not supposed to be a word, uh, but this phenomenon uh, is one that's emerging all across the state of North Carolina and frankly across the nation. Fifty years ago, the Brown versus Board of Education ruling called for an end to school segregation with all deliberate speed. Whereas some people saw speed, the South saw deliberate. And, and they took this as a message that there need not be great progress. It would be nearly 15 more years before school integration would get underway in the South. I knew you had access to a computer at home. But just how do you measure segregation? Researchers often look at the number of black students in schools that are more than 90 percent black. From 1968 to 1972, the number dropped sharply nationwide from 78 percent to 25 percent. But since then, the number of black students going to essentially all black schools is slowly climbing again, back up to 31 percent by 2001, and it appears to be rising. Look at it closely. That may not sound like a big increase unless you compare it to school districts that have successfully integrated. For example, in Orange County, no black students go to predominantly black schools, while in Durham County, about 23 percent do. In Cumberland County, it's about 6 percent, compared to more than 23 percent in Mecklenburg. And in Wake County, less than 1 percent of black students go to mostly black schools, while the number in Wayne County is almost 30 percent. If school systems don't address the issue, sometimes litigation will. Franklin County, for example, is getting ready to reassign students after a court order to desegregated schools. Okay, using your numbers. You'd be hard pressed to, to be able to answer whether it's race or whether it's economics. 
Charles Klotfelter is a public policy professor at Duke University who's written a book called After Brown, The Rise and Retreat of School Desegregation. He blames resegregation on suburban development that's lured middle to upper income white families out of the cities. He also says a more conservative Supreme Court has allowed school districts to escape desegregation rulings. And many of those districts have adopted the policy of neighborhood schools. Of course they're not discriminatory schools, but they are reflecting the realities of residential segregation. Ah. Klotfelter says such a reflection can be seen in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools. After a 1971 U.S. Supreme Court ruling ordered the busing of students, the district eventually achieved desegregation. But Rosalind Mickelson, a sociology professor at UNC Charlotte, says the system is slipping back. The uh, promise of equity and quality has not been realized. The promise of resegregation is being realized. Then the cause is... Mickelson blames a federal court ruling in 2001 declaring Charlotte Mecklenburg schools desegregated and relieving the district from further action. Mickelson also blames a new pupil assignment plan, allowing parents to choose schools closer to home. She says parents with the means to move have moved to neighborhoods with better schools, leaving poor parents and their children behind in schools lacking in educational resources. Unfortunately, schools with high concentrations of poor children, which also tend to be minority concentrated schools, are the least likely to have the most able educators. Some white parents in Goldsboro say that's why they pulled their children from inner city schools. Some black parents have done the same thing, at least the ones who could afford to. Many of those kids don't have a choice about where they can go to school or if they could get to another school. The trend towards resegregation has our state's education leaders taking notice. But with so many challenges in our schools, should desegregation be a priority? After all, some students do perform well academically in racially segregated schools. But many people say desegregation is about far more than academic performance. One day right now in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls. To many, the dream of school integration has less to do with academic progress than social progress. I have a dream. Scholars point out that even the Brown versus Board ruling says little about helping black students improve academically. The court dealt with issues about inferiority and feelings of self-worth, but achievement was not part of it. You get something like this. In Wayne County, school leaders say if the people want Goldsboro's inner city schools integrated, they can't make the argument on academic grounds. They say none of the schools are considered low performing and all have made solid growth in student performance as measured by the state's ABC's accountability standards. So this excellent uh, accountability model that the state has um, has measured these schools and determined that they are doing a good job and has actually rewarded the teachers in all six of those schools with bonuses for doing a good job. We have a real challenge here. And so Even the chairman of the State Board of Education says integration should take a backseat to academic performance. Segregation bothers me, but segregation bothers me less if I can get the students performing well. It is important uh, to have diversity, but I think it is more important to have a sound educational experience for youngsters. Isn't it lunchtime? Yes. It's a sentiment shared by Goldsboro High's principal. I would like to see more diversity, but it doesn't stop me from doing my job. When I get up and come to school in the morning, I'm not coming to school saying, what am I going to do to have a more diverse population here? Burden says her focus is on making sure her students get a good education and she insists that they can. They can go into the classroom, they can have a dream, they can uh, set a goal, and they can work here and achieve that goal. But others still argue that the goal of the school system should also be racial diversity. The idea of working 
and appreciating difference is not just an ideal that people can implement in their lives when they emerge from high school. They have to learn it along the way. Mickelson says many scientific studies show that students have more educational opportunities and perform better academically in a more diverse environment. No, thanks, Ms. Align. I'm standing right here. Diversity works when it's, it's done in an atmosphere where teachers, administrators, parents are all focused on both equity and excellence. You can't have one without the other. If you ask Mickelson and many other experts to provide an example, they point to Wake County. Paul Daniels is a student in Wake. He goes to Martin Middle School in Raleigh, a racially diverse magnet school with a rich arts and music program. His parents love the school, but not the commute. I think it's crazy that he goes past two middle schools to go to West Raleigh. But she knows the benefits. They need to understand everybody's culture because this is God's world. And he made all of us. Paul's father understood the importance of that when he entered the military. I said, well, integration prepared me for this. Okay, it's three things. Now he believes an integrated school is helping his son prepare for the future. Perimeter of an equilateral triangle. If it was a school of just African Americans, I believe I'd be missing the entire point of diversity. Desegregation is important because, you know, you have to, you have to, you know, you have to interact with other people to understand exactly what they are about. Hurry up, quick, quick, quick! Peter Helm is also a student at Martin Middle. His Come parents in, believe his school's diversity is preparing him for life in the real no. world. Good shot. It's not going to be like the black banker, the white banker. It's not going to be that. It's going to be the banker. Schools are a wonderful strategy to build a society that is colorblind. I'm not going to attack you. You're not going to attack me. Perhaps her son is evidence of that theory. I don't really consider people, oh, these are the black people, these are the Indian people, these are the white people. I, I, I don't think about that. They're just, these are you got, you got people. These are my friends at school. Which way do you go and why do you go there? In the 1980s, Wake County began creating magnet schools to draw white students to areas with predominantly black and low-income students. In 2000, school leaders established a diversity goal. Instead of race, federal poverty guidelines and student performance guide pupil attendance lines. Many parents resisted, but Wake County persisted. You have to help educate that resistance to the point of knowing that this is in the best interest of not only your child, but all children. Of its 125 schools, Wake has 110 that are either schools of excellence or schools of distinction by state academic standards. And its students, of all races, are scoring well above state and national averages. Any county can do what Wake County has done. If Wake County can successfully integrate its schools and achieve racial balance, why don't other school systems, systems like Wayne County? Many say they can if they can get beyond the politics. But if they don't or won't, what then? <laughs> In Wayne County, members of the NAACP and a group called Concerned Clergy used the 50th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education decision as a call to action. We can challenge the Board of Education of Wayne County. Both groups have filed a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights about the segregation of Goldsboro's inner city schools. We need to implement Brown. We need to decide that this community is going to be a part of the future. Can we cancel this R with that R square? 
While school officials have pointed to the academic progress of students in inner city schools, community activists say it's only because they had so far to go. They point out that last year 42 percent of students in Goldsboro's inner city schools failed their end of grade test. Even if they were scoring 90 percent and it was all black or all white for that matter, Brown says that is not America. We have an integrated city council, integrated school board, integrated county commissioner, integrated boards. We ought to have the same thing in our public school system. That integrated city council agrees and has threatened legal action against the school board. To me, common sense would tell you that if your inner city schools are 99 percent black, you're not going to attract the industry, you're not going to attract young families. It's just not culturally or socially right to have that inside your city. It wasn't caused by the Board of Education. It can't be fixed by the Board of Education. Many school officials say the city council needs to do something about the high concentration of low-income housing projects in Goldsboro's inner city attendance area. I'm not going to say that there's not a problem. There is, there is a problem. There's not an easy solution to the problem. It can't be just the school system alone to try to, to solve the problems that we have facing in society here in Wayne County. The school board tightened the student transfer policy, but community activists say it's too little too late. Right now, the school board has no plans to redraw attendance lines or establish magnet schools or any other firm proposals for a solution. And so far, it faces no pressure from the courts to find one. Should the state intervene as it does with low-performing schools? I think with the pattern of resegregation that's emerging across the state, it has increasingly become an issue that the state should consider stepping in on. The law doesn't allow the state to have a say in local pupil assignments, but Ward says it may be time to change the law so the state can send teams of experts into a district that is struggling with the issue of racial segregation. But teams can't replace political courage, and that's what's necessary on the part of local board members if our schools are going to remain diverse. It's standing up for the policies that may be needed to create diversity that takes political courage. Whether it's redrawing attendance lines, busing, or creating new magnet schools, progress almost always takes leaders willing to make tough choices. Just as we have been looking back at what has happened in the 50 years since Brown, today's leaders may want to consider how they will be judged by their children and grandchildren 50 years from now. I think in 50 years, you and I are going to be judged harshly by our children and grandchildren. It's, there's no way around it. What's up, Pop? Amber Jacobs and Susie Potter and many of their classmates at Goldsboro High School understand the need for political courage. It's gotten to the point where somebody now just needs to step out and take the first step in fixing this problem, but nobody wants to make the people in their district mad. They want to keep everybody happy, but it's not, that's not going to solve the problem at this stage. Despite the situation at her school, Amber Jacobs graduated this year, second in her class, and is headed off to college. For a glimpse at the social colorblindness that she and many others hope for, one only needs to look within the walls of the high school she leaves behind. <laughs> This year, it's nearly all black student body crowned Susie Potter as Miss Goldsboro High. People are people and we can accept each other regardless of our differences. These are just people that you go to school with, they're your friends. It has nothing to do with the color of their skin. 